One of the greatest uses of motion tracking is to replace one object with another. For a replacement to be convincing, not only must the corner the, it be in the correct position in the corners, but it must also exhibit the same perspective as the original, and that perspective must be able to change over time as the original does. Now this is where corner pinning tracking comes in. So with this method you typically track the four corners of a rectangular shape, for example a screen, and then uh, this distorts the new layer so that the corners match the object's original corners. So it's like motion tracking but multiplied four times over and with some additional features. So you can see that I've got a script open. Uh, it's already got two nodes in. It, the, the plate is this, uh, is this CRT monitor uh, that looks like it's uh, driving this MRI scanner. Uh, we, can see it's, uh, we can see it's got a concave screen. Um, and then in the second view we've got our screen replacement which is essentially this kind of heart monitor graphic. Okay, so I'll just jump back to the first frame and we'll um, and we'll go back to our primary view. Okay. So we're going to perform a four point corner pin or a on, on this uh, on this monitor. So I'll just zoom in a little bit. Obviously I'm working with limited real estate so um, for the screen capture software so uh, um, we're going to be a little bit tight for space, but we should be able to just uh, do it by middle mouse in around, just to just to, to look around. So the first thing we need to do is just select this node and add a tracker. I'm just hitting the tab button and then type in until the tracker comes up. The re I do that as my main way of getting at nodes because I know the name of most of the nodes that I use, but I can rarely remember where they fit within these uh, menus and submenus. I'll just disconnect that pipe from now. So you can see the tracker nodes applied, but at the moment it sits in the uh, in the properties panel dormant, waiting for us to apply tracker trackers. So I'm going to add a tracker now. You can see that that comes in, and we get the we get the three point uh, the three part box applied. Just like with any other feature tracking, we have a feature center, which is basically the center of the uh, of the tracking area. Think of it like an anchor point. Then we have the feature region which is basically the cluster, the area in which the software will look for a cluster or a configuration of pixels and then we have this outer or search region which is basically for, uh, where the software will look for that same cluster of pixels on a frame by frame basis. Okay so we're going to start by setting to our bottom left and this is a, an idiosyncrasy of Nuke which is definitely worth you knowing is that we always work from the bottom left and we work round in an anti-clockwise direction so we always start bottom left, bottom right, top right, top left and the reasons for that will become apparent when we actually start with the corner pin node. I've just reduced the size of the of the feature region because I think that it'll be able to find this range of pixels from a frame to frame basis. I'm not bothering too much about the search region there isn't a great deal of movement in this shot. One thing I am going to do is name my track so this is bottom left just BL will do as an abbreviation uh, and again the reasons for that will become apparent when we actually start to uh, to apply the corner pin node to this. Okay so we've done that one so we're ready to move on to the on to the second one which we've already established needs to be in the bottom right corner. Same rules apply. Our anchor point needs to be right into the corner of these of the of the display. We know that with CRT monitors there they don't project all the way to the edge. Again I can reduce my feature region and I'm going to call this one bottom right or BR. Now add another one. And drag this into this uh, into this corner. Again, reduce the size of the feature region, and this one is top right or TR. And finally, top left. Again, as tight as I can into the into the area. If you're struggling with this, zoom in, and you get a little bit more precision. You can also drag around in inside the thumbnail. But anyway, that's top left. We can see that the export node is set to corner pin, uh, so we don't have to do anything there. So that allows us to look at this when we applied the first one then it applied the transform node. It hasn't applied any transform uh, to any of the others but that's okay because with corner pin selected it will basically get its translation positions from uh, fr all, the, all the, th the, the other three will get their translation positions uh, or they'll get their, they'll, they'll be, they'll get their instruction 
to uh, to track on translation from the top one. We don't need to rotate, uh, enable rotation and scale. Even though this is handheld camera, and um, we know that the plate is rotating and possibly scaling, um, it it doesn't matter because essentially the, these will get their information by triangulating between each other. So just to explain what I mean by that, if that stays in one place and that moves up and down we know that there's rotation so that will be able to establish rotation from the relationship between the the various tracking points in the system. Okay so we should be ready now to um, to perform our, 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 uh, our tracking of this. We're on the very first frame so what I need to do is I just need to uh, shift select all four trackers you can see that that activates them on the screen I could actually do it in the same way just by marquee selecting all four in the display. So one and the same thing, tantamount to the same. They just need to be selected. So once I've done that, I can now track forwards. I'm on the very first frame, so I'm tracking forwards. So I just hit the track forward button and away it goes. As a rule of thumb, you could you can essentially start anywhere on the uh, on the timeline. Um, as a rule of thumb, it's best to go for an area uh, 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 in time where we see it, we see our corners the best, because sometimes they may be slightly deformed, distorted, or, or something. So, but in this case, the movement's so minimal that it really doesn't matter. All it would mean is if we were starting mid-frame, then we would have to track in one direction, then come back to that point, and then track in the opposite direction. Okay, so we can see that the tracking's been completed. We can see these 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 motion paths, which are uh, wh which represent the movement of each of these corners. Uh, over time. Now what I recommend that you do uh, after this is then go back over each of your corners, select them individually and just play them out, uh, just watching the thumbnail as you do just to make sure that, they d that we don't uh, have any glitches or any sort of severe deviations from our original location point. You can see that one's just nice. Okay, so I'll go to the bottom right, repeat Okay, so that's the principle. If we found that there was uh, there was a problem, say from this point where it jumped out of, out of position, then what we would do with this is that we would come to this button here, and we would uh, clear the keyframes from that point forward, and then we would retrack, would maybe re relocate our marker, and then track again. But we don't need to do that in this particular case, and I don't need to show you how to check the other two now. I know I've done this before, so I know that they're they're okay on this particular uh, track. Uh, but that's the principle. We would work our way through each of these, checking as we go. So we're now ready to add our uh, our heart monitor graphic over the top of this display. So, because this is going over the top of this one, then we need to uh, we need to uh, apply a merge. So I'm just selecting this and it in M, which is the shortcut for the merge. And um, and we want this. This is over the top, so this needs to be connected into the A pipe. And uh, and our B needs to be the the plate, and we just need to reconnect the viewer to the bottom of the merge node. And I'll just use a dot node just to break that out, so it's just a little bit more linear a little bit easier to see so we can see that the merge has merged it over now that's certainly not looking like we would expect it to we can see the uh, can see the graphic being dumped over the top but it's obviously occupying the full screen so uh, we don't want that we obviously want it to be in this in this space here so what do we do okay well this particular track we apply a corner pin node put it in. Okay, I'm just going to turn off all my all my nodes in the properties panel so we can see um, so we, we can see the corner pin node by itself. Okay, now this is the this is the interesting thing and this is the reason why we uh, why we configured our tracking markers in the same way because essentially we have four points in the corner pinner we can see one two three four this is why we organized our tracks in this way it just means that our bottom left is going to correspond to their bottom right top right top left it just makes it a li little bit more coherent okay so what essentially happens is now is, is that we basically link these points to our tracks so just to give you an example of how this works to one which is going to be our bottom left this is how we do it this is two one in the properties panel we just hit this we come down to link to now this is going off the screen unfortunately so maybe I can 
do something about that just by undocking this for a second. So we're clicking, choosing link to tracker one, bottom left. Okay, and we can see now on our graphic that this corner is now pinned in to the corner of the of the display. So let's repeat it. Unfortunately, I'm having to block the screen as I go, but that's because of the limited space within the screen capture software. Again, link to tracker one, this time bottom right. And we can see now the second corner is locked into the corner of the monitor. So I'll just repeat the the other two without moving the... So we want the top right, and then we want the top left. And we can see now that the monitor has been pinned into the cor into the corners of the of the display. And if we play this out now, we can also see that 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 display is now moving with the uh, it's now it's now moving with the movement that was uh, that was picked up by a tracker. So in 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 the simplest of terms, that is how we performed our corner pin. Okay, but there's clearly some refinements that we need to do to finish this uh, this composite. Um, first of all, we can see that because we're we're projecting a flat display onto a concave screen, we've got some areas of separation here, which is uh, which is actually sort of making uh, giving the the gag away a little bit. So we're going to need to do something about that. We also need to do something about this very sharp edge. We would expect to see a little bit of fall off with that. So we'll do that first. So to do that, I'm just going to select my corner pin and I'm going to hit the tab button and I'm going to start typing edge until I get my edge blur. Okay, so if I just toggle that on and off now, you can already see the effect and that's because the edge blur automatically comes with a default setting of 3 in terms of the size. You can see that as I extend that out, it blurs in more. Um, three is For a standard definition footage like this, 3 is actually more than what we need. I think 2 is perfectly adequate. And all that's doing is just giving us a little bit of softness around the edge, a little bit of fall off. Okay. Now clearly this has to be after the corner pin because otherwise we'd be we'd be uh, we'd be blurring the edge before it had actually been projected onto the screen. It'd be very difficult to actually quantify the amount of blur that we needed to apply if, for example, the edge blur was at this point. Okay. The next thing we need to do is that we need to deal with this uh, with this concave screen and make our our flat screen match it. And to do this, we're going to apply a um, a, a grid warp. So I'm going to select my read node, and there is a reason why I'm putting this before the corner pin, um, which I'll explain in a second. So I'm just typing grid warp, and you can see what happens when this comes in. We get what you might expect to be this kind of grid system, which is based on Bezier handles. So effectively what we can do within this is that we can basically just pull these handles down and match as best we can match the distortion of the uh, of the concave screen. We can see that uh, it's pre predominantly the bottom and the left corners where we see the majority of the display just because of the position of the camera. Okay, just have to be a little bit careful with that. Obviously, I could take more care and just and just angle these points a little bit more and just get it absolutely right. But I'm I'm, I'm mindful of time. Okay, let's say that we're happy enough with that. So we can see that we've got, uh, you know, we've we've matched the corners. So if I just hit the tab button to see the screen, we can now see, and that that looks a little bit better. Okay, so I'll hit the uh, space bar to go back to this display. One thing I would say is that, uh, and we could go to all sorts of degrees with this, but I'll just do I'll just do one bit as a kind of proof of concept here, um, is that we've got all this blue spill casting out from the uh, casting out from the original display around there, which clearly doesn't match what we what we're seeing on our new display. 
just uh, I'll just clear my uh, box so that we, uh, we we don't see the grid anymore. Um, we we would not see this blue display from this kind of screen. It just would not be projecting that kind of colour. We need to sort of really take this out. Okay, so how do we do that? We can also see it on the on the on the keyboard and on some other areas as well. But we won't bother with that for now. The same principle would essentially apply. So how would we deal with this? Okay. Well, essentially, what we need to do is perform a color correction, but we need to isolate the color correction to a particular area. So, and really, the area that we're that we're focusing on is the kind of like the bottom part of the of the um, of the monitor frame, up to the round about the screen, and then over to the left. So, pretty much dominant on the two areas that we did the warp on. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply a roto node to isolate that area. I don't need it to be connected to anything. And, and now I'm just going to draw a shape. So I've got my um, I've got my Bezier tool. So I'm just going to come around here and maybe just I don't I really don't need much curvature on this. Certainly not at the top. And I'll maybe just have a point in here just to give myself a little bit of a curve there at the bottom. Okay, that will do for what we're for what we're trying to get across here. So I'll just clear the no uh, the the no properties again, and now what we need to do is we need to perform a color correction, which is actually going to take out this uh, this brightness and this blue. So I'm going to apply a color correct node, and I'm going to put it in below the tracker. Obviously, it needs to be before the merge because I don't want to color correct the screen as well. Okay, so what am I essentially doing here? Well, what I'm doing essentially is I'm desaturating. So I can you can see that there, where I take the desaturation out, that that's actually going to get rid of some of the blue. But we've got a slight problem because if I just uh, if I just open up the gamma and really do something ridiculous, you can see that it's affecting everything. Okay, but this is where the roto node comes in because I can now mask from the color correction to the roto node and you can see now that this is only affecting the areas that are within the confines of the mask so I can now go back to the mask if I want to and make any refinements to that if I've missed you know if I want to pick up some additional areas of spill that I didn't originally see I can do that okay but obviously what I've done here is is a slightly ridiculous color correction I need to sort of re reinstate that so let's start by desaturating now and looking at what happens when we actually bring the saturation down and we can see that fairly quick quickly we see our spill coming right out of that shot so that's not bad by itself the only thing I would say possibly is that we just need to warm it up a little bit there's more pink tones in the in the in the non masked areas than there are here this is just a little bit blue and a little bit cool so we probably do need to add a little bit of red tonality into that area as well just I'm just doing it on the gamma and we can see that applied and we've got a color corrected area so if essentially that principle would also apply down here on the on the keyboard okay one last thing we may want to do is we may want to just uh, add a little bit of feather to our mask we might just want to punch in a tiny little bit, bit of feather there just to just to soften the edges a little bit and make the transition between our masked area and our non-masked area a little bit smoother. So you can see that that if you just look on this right side for example you can see that the feather is just eroding the the color correction beyond the mask slightly. So again we want to be subtle on that just giving ourselves a little bit of a, of a soft lead and you can see there that I've, what I've done is actually made that worse with the, with the feather. So if I was actually feathering out like that and actually creating that kind of gap I would probably just need to revisit and just extend my mask line out a little bit to compensate for that but anyway that's uh, that's for a separate tutorial okay that's the end of this I hope you found that useful I hope that you'll now be able to go away and apply this corner pin principle to your own projects